I know we got, we'll have some more people coming in as we get get going along. Beautiful day, great day to be at God's house. But we're, me and Ronnie, we were just talking. We're ready to be in God's house, uh, so we can we can fellowship like like we want to and uh, like it's intended to be, and we can do praise and worship like we want to and desire to. So we're going to uh, get into our our lesson this morning. Uh, we, you know, last week we studied the first two chapters of Galatians. We we looked at Paul's asserting his apostleship and his authority. That's the foundation of everything else that came. We're going to be in the third chapter of Galatians today, and we're going to be looking at we're going to be looking at mindset. Everything in life is about mindset. You view everything in your life through a certain prism through a life experience, through an attitude, through a, um, through a set of goggles. Whether you understand it or, or, or agree or, or what, it, everything you view in life is viewed through, through a set of goggles. The goggles that, that have been given to you through life experience or through uh, spiritual experience, that's how you view everything. And you see through those goggles based on, again, the, the life experience that you've had. That if you, if you have been a, let, let's just say, I'll give you an example. Back many years ago, several years ago, probably four or so, four or five, my granddaughter was in, in a traffic crash. She was in a car with uh, her babysitter and they were riding down the road and, and had a wreck. So for that, for there on after every little bit, she would say every time we'd leave, she'd say, "Bye, don't have a wreck." She's always thinking and associating a car with a traffic crash. Those two things came together because her goggles had been changed. The way she viewed things had been changed. Well, this whole study of the book of Galatians has to do with a change in the view through the goggles, through the lenses of life that the Galatians had started looking at how salvation occurred. <coughs> Excuse me. So Paul started out last week by laying his foundation for, listen, I am an apostle of God. I've had this experience. Christ sent me to you, and he went through laying out his credentials of why and who he was. So look at the first verse of the third chapter of Galatians. And he starts out saying, oh, foolish Galatians. Now, he's already laid out his, <laughs> his starting point. And what he's saying is here, oh, you dear idiot friends of mine, is what he's saying. You're, you're, you're just stupid. Now, this word foolish means lacking wisdom, discernment. In other words, he's saying to them, you had the ability to think, but you're just not choosing to use it. Now that's important. They're not mentally deficient. They're not doctrinally deficient. Listen to me. They're not doctrinally deficient. They received the right word initially. What they're doing is making a conscious head choice to accept something else. And that's a problem. That's a real problem. Because Paul's saying, you received the truth, but now you're choosing to ignore it and go somewhere else and, and uh, uh, embrace a different doctrine. He's saying, who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath evidently set forth crucified among you? This is a very interesting choice, choice of words that Paul uses. When he says, who has bewitched you? Now, bewitching has like being under a spell, like being hypnotized. Now, back in ancient times, who had, I can see you, a lot of you. Who's ever heard the phrase, uh, the evil eye? Y'all heard of putting the evil eye on somebody? Well, that's an that's really an ancient term. Throwing, put, casting an evil eye on somebody has to do kind of related to this uh, bewitching. In antiquity, 
they considered, they looked at how a snake could actually mesmerize its prey and, and could get so close and then strike and, and, co and, and brace it in its coils and, and uh, suffocate it. So they looked at, <clears throat> they looked at that, that evil eye, that bewitching attitude, that mesmerizing thing. And Paul's saying, who's come in and bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? The truth of what? What truth? The truth of salvation through faith. That's what he's saying. Now, do you obey faith or do you obey God? You obey God because God's the giver of faith, right? So what Paul's saying is, who has tricked you? Who's bewitched you? Who has, has lured you into a point that you would disobey God? That's the real question. That's the real point that Paul's pointing out here. Because he's saying Christ Jesus. Remember, this was only about 20 years after Christ's crucifixion and resurrection. He's saying this has been done and wide open. This is not a secret. You know what's happened. And now you're trying to uh, uh, believe something that's not true. Now, this, these false teachers, these Judaizers that had come in, they were very charismatic people. Now, I have had occasion to run into a lot of con men over the years. People who, this is what they do for a living. And without fail, every single one of those people that I ever ran into had a very charismatic personality. I mean, you couldn't help but like them. They had that gift. They had the gift of gab. They could come on me smooth talking people. And I mean, you you start trusting them. That's that's their gift. That's how they're con men. And there are a lot of false teachers in Paul's day and listen today, who are leading people into false doctrine, but they have a smooth delivery. They are talkers. They're very charismatic. They can make friends at the drop of a hat. Now we haven't done an Andy in a while, but y'all remember. The, uh, the episode where Gentleman Dan, the con man, is brought in. And Gentleman Dan, he tells Andy, he's, oh, making friends is my business. This is what I do. That's the way these smooth-talking false teachers are. So they come in and they start teaching them this false doctrine. Now, listen, having a soft heart is a great thing, but having a soft head is not. Because <laughs> you, you can fall prey real easy to, to false doctrine. And he says, this truth that was so evidently set forth before you. Now, this is an interesting choice of words Paul uses here as well, because this means it's like it's put on a billboard for you to see. It's not hidden. It's not difficult. It's put out here for you to see. Now, some of you may be old enough to remember this, most of us are not, but I've seen it in, in movies and cartoons and stuff like that. But back in the 30s and the 40s, back before mass media, uh, the papers were around, but people who couldn't afford it couldn't take a paper. But they used to go along in neighborhoods, particularly in large cities, when people had been evicted and whatnot, they would post notices on, build, on, on fences and on uh, polls and stuff where you're being sued or you owe a bill or something like that. Some of those things, that's the way they used to do things. So that kind of gives us this imagery of being so evidently set forth. What Paul's saying is this truth was given to you and it's out there for all of you to see. It's not hidden. So it's very evident. So then he goes into the second, now all that in the first verse. <laughs> So you can tell we might have a little bit of a challenge to get through. And in the second verse, he said, this only would I learn of you. In other words, just, just tell me this. This is the one thing I want you to tell me. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Plain statement, right? Plain statement. Paul says, I want you to tell me something. Did you work your way into salvation or did you just believe it? There's no in-between. Paul tells me, which one is it? Did you work by the law or did you receive it in faith? 
Now that statement leads Paul into an exposition and he starts laying out his case. Now, if, if I were in a courtroom and I were uh, going to present a, a, a case to a jury, the first thing I want to do is I want to make a statement. I want to lay out, here's what I'm going to try to show you. No, I wouldn't say it that way. If I were put for the case, I would say, here's what I'm going to show you. Here's what the evidence will show. In every court case I've ever seen, both the prosecution and the defense start out with making a declarative statement, something that, that, that lays out, here's what the evidence is going to show. The defense will come in and say, here's what they're going to try to say, but here's what we're going to assert. So it's a declarative statement. So this is what Paul's doing. He's making a declarative statement at the very beginning. He's saying, I want to know, faith or works, which is it? So he lays this out here. And he says, as long as my page don't flip over, he says, are you so foolish, having begun in the spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? And he's saying, it doesn't get any better than what you've already got. You received God in faith as it was intended. And now you're trying to switch it around and change it and try to do things in the flesh. And that's why he calls them unlearned, ignorant, lacking wisdom when he says fools or foolish. He said, have you suffered so many things in vain, if it yet be in vain? Here, therefore, that ministereth to you, the Spirit worketh miracles among you, doeth he it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. Now he's saying, he's, he's again making a very declarative statement, you receive the Spirit of God in faith. And now you're trying to change it. You're trying to add to it. You're trying to do something better. And like I said last week, the implication here is this. You're saying, God, what you did isn't good enough. I'm going to add to it. I'm going to add to it, God. Your work on Christ, your work on, on the cross was not good enough. So we're going to try to add to it. So he's saying he's calling them foolish. Now, what happens at this point is Paul starts going back and looking at the Old Testament. As we start moving through here, that's what he's going to do. He's going to start referencing back to the Old Testament. But these Galatians had suffered in some way. Now, we don't know how they suffered, but they had suffered for the, for the sake of Christ. And he's saying, are you going to make this in vain, the suffering in vain, all for nothing? He also references miracles, but we don't know what the miracles were. They're notable. Any miracle is notable, but they're notable miracles because he mentions the fact that they've taken place among them. In other words, that's not been done in secret either. They've seen those miracles happen. So he goes on and he says, in the, in the next verse, verse 6 of our printed text, he said, Even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. We'll stop right there for a minute. He brings up Abraham. Now, who are the Galatians? Y'all remember when we talked about who the Galatians were? There were really, there's really two areas, the north and the south of Galatia. The north area was settled by the Celtics. The south was more of a, a different ethnic group of, of more of Roman culture. But he's writing this to the church area of Galatia, to many groups of people, both north and south. So what he's talking to here is he's talking to a lot of people of Greek background, but he's also talking to people who have been, who were Jews who have been converts. Now, he's talking about Abraham. We also know this. When Paul would go in and he would start a church, y'all remember how uh, throughout, uh, we just did a study here not long ago, when Paul would go in and he would he would talk about uh, he would settle a church and he would he would teach them and then he would move on and he left them the responsibility to teach and to, to win others 
That's, that's what he was so proud of, that his churches would go out and win others to Christ. Here the Galatians are not doing that. They've instead accepted this additional doctrine. When he goes back into the Old Testament, apparently these very charismatic uh, Judaizers, I'm sorry, this thing keeps falling off my head. Uh, they come in and started teaching about Abraham. Now, what do we know about Abraham? He's the one that God chose and called out, right? He's the one that God chose and called out. And what did God tell Abraham? I'm going to bless you, Abraham. And from you, from you, all the nations of the world will be blessed through you. He made a promise. He made a covenant with Abraham. And so Paul's saying, hey, if these Judaizers have come in and used very like y'all y'all know when like when you're listening to a phone conversation, you can hear one side of the conversation and you can hear what's being said, and you can draw a pretty good conclusion about what's being said on the other end by how this person's talking, right? And things that they're saying. You can kind of tell what the conversation's about. Well, when we're looking at this, we can kind of tell what's taking place, that the information that's come to Paul, or what Paul's saying. So very likely these, these uh, false teachers had come in and started teaching about the law and about the promise that was given to Abraham in the law and circumcision, that God required circumcision. Now, Paul's going back and, said, and saying, well, you know, you, this was brought up, so yeah, let's look at this a little closer. Let's look at what it says. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same of the children of Abraham, and the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. So Paul's saying, okay, let's go back and look at the Old Testament. If these Judaizers are coming in and they want to throw this up, let's go back and look at it. Now, who was Paul before his conversion? He was Saul, right? He was that zealous, hard-charging, uh, dedicated rabbi, that teacher, that understander of the law, the one who, who could go out and... and uh, he was pursuing the church because of his great... He talked about it in the first chapter. He talked about it because I was so zealous for the traditions of my fathers. God chose this man on purpose. It wasn't an accident. He knew he needed somebody with that kind of zealous attitude to go out and win the heathen, the, the lost, because God knew that these false teachers were going to come along. So Paul says, hey, you want to talk about the Old Testament? I'm a Pharisee. Let's talk about the Old Testament. You're in my wheelhouse, buddy. I know this thing. I've had to recite five uh, books of the of the, the law. And I, yeah, I understand them. I understand. So, yeah, let's talk about what it is in the Old Testament. So, Paul's saying, <laughs> yeah, he's like, oh, I got this. I'm all about the Old Testament. I understand it. So, let's talk about Abraham. So, let's go. He goes back and he looks at Abraham and he starts laying out the, the argument for Abraham. So, these false teachers have started bringing this in because they wanted to show that that there was a requirement put on to Abraham later. But see, where they miss it is Paul saying, listen, this was 430 years before the law was ever given. This is 430 years before the law was ever given that Abraham and God entered into this agreement. And he says to this, listen to what he says here. He said that it was accounted to Abraham as righteousness. Now, accounted is just what it sounds like. It's a legal term. It's an accountant, one who follows tallies, positives and negatives. Now, here's the important thing. Abraham had no righteousness. He had no right standing with God. Only his faith, only his faith is what gave him right standing with God. So Paul's saying, listen, all that law had nothing to do with Abraham's righteousness. Right. Nothing. Paul's saying, if you want to look at this thing, 
like it's intended. Look at the faith that Abraham had in God because that's where it all came from. And Paul's starting to show this parallel now. He's starting to bring it together. That faith is the only way that we can reach God. Now, Abraham didn't understand the concept of the Messiah yet, but he understood the concept of God. Yeah. And he understood, you're the only way, God. You're the only way that I could ever have right relationships, only through you. What did Abraham tell his son, Isaac, on the mountain? When, I, when, when he said, well, where's the sacrifice? And he said, God will provide for himself a sacrifice. He didn't know what prophetic words he was uttering at that point. But he knew, I trust my God. He knew that. And so that's why it's accounted to him as righteousness. So as we look at this, um, and let, let me start right here. We're, we're talking about these false teachers, these very charismatic teachers. Let me, let me go back and visit something I should have said earlier. It doesn't matter who you listen to, whether it, Sunday school teacher, preacher, it doesn't matter. You better know God's word or you will be led astray. Right. Amen. You got to know it. It doesn't matter what I say, what Pastor Foster says, what anybody else says. It doesn't matter. Get in God's word. Because if it's not there, we're liars. Plain and simple. If it's not in God's word, because that's the authority. If it's not there, we're wrong. So he lays this out with with um, uh, with Abraham a very clear clear uh, understanding. He said, "There's two types of righteousness here. There's your righteousness through the law, through works." And he's basically saying, "Which one of you's ever completely kept the law?" And then you got the righteousness that's accounted to you through faith. So he's drawing this very distinct um, parallel. Now, what do we know that Scripture says about our righteousness? It's as filthy rags, right? Our very best is as filthy rags. So there's no other option here. Paul goes in verse 10 and says, For as many as are the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Now there's two key words there, and I emphasized them when I read it. All and do. This is an all or nothing if you can't do it. So Paul's saying, you want to live by the works of the law? You got to do every one of them, all of them, perfectly. Who's done that? Nobody's done it but one. Jesus Christ. He came not to do away with the law, but to fulfill it, to complete it. He's the only one that's ever been able to do it. Why is the, why is the law given? Well, Paul's going to get into that in just a little bit. But let's look at this. These people, these believers of Jewish background, believe the law to be a blessing. But Paul's saying law, the law's not a blessing. The law's a curse. The law is a curse for me and you because it's impossible for us to do it. I remember hearing somebody say one time, my mom and dad told me I could be anything I wanted to be. And I have tried and tried to be a professional basketball player and I can't do it. Now, I used to blame it on the fact I was short, but then Bugsy Bogues came along and he was like five foot seven, you know, and he could dunk a basketball. So it ain't a short thing. I just ain't got it. You know, I can't be anything. There's certain things you just cannot do. And keeping God's law is something man cannot do. Our nature is absolutely contrary to it. But even as great as Abraham was, even as great as he was, he was unable to keep that law. Now, the Jewish rabbis didn't really admire Abraham's faith. They thought he was doing so well because he was keeping God's standards. David, a man after God's own heart, could not keep the law. It's impossible. So Paul's laying out this argument here. If you can't do it all, you can't do any of it. And you have to do it in order to be compliant. 
So if you don't do it all, you're under the curse. Verse 11. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident. Now, I love, I love the way he does this. You got that other hand held blank? Where's that? Is it all already? change up here. I, I'm tired of this thing falling off my head. I thought I had big enough ears to keep it on. Maybe that's what's wrong. The ears are too big to keep flop, flopping off. I'm not real sure why. I'm, but Paul's saying this is evident. He said you have to look at this thing and examine it. It's evident that me and you cannot keep the law. It's impossible. The just shall live by faith. And he lays that out there. Now, that is scripture. It comes from Habakkuk. Um, no, am I right? No. Yeah, Habakkuk 2.4. That's what I was thinking. And so because he didn't say it is written like he normally do, does when he quotes from scripture, this apparently is something they're very familiar with. But he's saying the just live by faith, not by the law. And the law is not of faith. But the man that doeth them shall live in them. So he's quoting here and he's saying, these paths of the law and faith do not run parallel. They're not side-by-side -side roads that run parallel. They don't lead to the same place because you're not good enough to ride on that road. Right. Only Christ could follow that path. You have to depend on faith. So he lays this argument out there that the law is a standard that no man could ever meet. So uh, when, when he's laying out the, the understanding to them, you have to remember they, their thinking has already been changed. It's already been um, altered. Their prison, their goggles that they're looking through have already been moved around and they're looking at things a little differently than they should. And when, he, when uh, he's laying out this argument, he's saying, those people that told you you had to do things that are in the law, they're telling you to do things that it's impossible for you to do. There was a, a joke I heard one time about uh, a high, they, they were doing a, uh, like a high rise building. It was under construction. It was being done in a, an area where they had to pull a bunch of uh, Less, lesser educated people in to kind of do some of the work. And they hadn't really done this kind of work before. They came in, they started doing that kind of work, and, and uh, some guys were walking around, and they looked up, and there's was, was a fellow standing up there on the top of this floor where they just started doing some completion of, of the work, and that guy standing up there, and he said, hey, come here, look at this, look at this. Feel that wind coming up off the side of this building. Man, that's, that's amazing wind, that's, that's amazing. Feel that wind, feel that wind. So the guy walks over, sticks his arm out, you know, he sees, he's, you know, 20 stories up, and he sticks his hand out over there, and he feels that strong wind. Sure enough, it's a strong wind. It's there. It's, and that guy walks up and says, I bet you that wind's enough to keep you up, up if you stepped off the building. And he said, I don't know about that. And the guy said, well, let's see. And he goes up there, and he, he steps out, and he's just hanging in the air, just hanging there. And he steps back in and said, see, see, look at that. And he steps back out again, hanging in the air. And he steps back in. And that guy said, that's amazing. He said, try it. It's, it's awesome. And that guy steps out and falls 20 stories to his death. And those other guys look up and say, look, Clark Kent's up there messing with him rednecks again. Old Superman's up there messing with him. Same thing happens with these false teachers. They're showing them something that looks like it should work. Because Abraham later had to be circumcised. But it didn't have anything to do. It was something God added on later. It had nothing to do with his right standing in God. And that's what Paul's trying to explain to them. Listen, Paul believed first. He had faith first. And he was in right standing with God. So then he goes on in verse 13. It says, Christ hath, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, now here he goes quoting scripture again, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, 
that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Now, it's important how he, how he lays this out. He's saying, first of all, Christ redeemed. Now, y'all remember when you used to collect green stamps? Some of y'all older folks, y'all know, I remember, I remember, I remember the green stamps. I had books of them. You know, and my dad was uh, back years ago. He sold. Uh, he was running a standard coffee route. He a lot of stuff they sold. You could redeem green stamps off of, and, and uh, so he, there was a collector. I remember those things. And then you would take them and you would cash them in, right? And then you used to collect bottles and, and milk bottles and soda bottles and stuff like that. And you would go and, and trade them in. You had something. You trade them. You got something back. A friend of mine posted last week, said, do you know if the redemption centers are open? In other words, where you took stuff and redeemed, and I, and I said, well, if you're talking about churches, yeah, they're always open. If you want to be redeemed. Well, that started a little conversation on Facebook back and forth. I didn't watch what she, wasn't what she was talking about. But here Christ is buying back, redeeming. And that phrase was used in antiquity having to do with bringing a price for a slave. Now, all slaves at this time were not people captured in war. Many of them were slaves because they had been sold as an indentured servant because they were in poverty. So you might have one member of the family, a brother or sister, or whatever, that's free, and the other one that's in bondage. So that family member would come pay the price to get you out of trouble, out of bondage. Jesus Christ came for his brother, his brethren to come and redeem us and pay the price. This is a Greek word. So he bore the punishment that we deserved and rescued us. So he, he makes this, uh, uh, this argument about what Christ had already done. And he's doing that to try to bring this circle back around to understand that there's nothing more that you can do to earn your redemption. It was all done through Christ. So he goes on and he, he talks about the redemption and faith through Jesus Christ. Look at uh, verse 18. For if the inheritance be of the law, it's no more of promise. But God gave Abraham by promise. Okay, I'm not sure. Okay, this coming comes and goes. So this uh, is a reference to a will, a last will and testament. Now, once a will is confirmed, once it's done, and already it's recorded, there can be no changes to it. It is done. It's set. It's over. And what Paul's saying in here is this. This thing with God is done. It's confirmed. And how was it confirmed? How was this promise, how was this uh, agreement that God has made being confirmed? It was confirmed at Calvary on the cross. What Jesus did was so perfect and so complete and so fulfilling that there's nothing else that can be added to it. That's Paul's whole argument. There's nothing else that can be added to it. So he goes on here and says it's been fulfilled, and it was fulfilled through Abraham's promise in Christ Jesus. Because when it references here the seed, which we'll see down in verse 19, uh, that it was fulfilled because God promised Abraham through, through you all nations will be blessed. It's not through the Jew. Nah, it's not through the Jew, it's through Jesus Christ. That's how it was going to be done. So he lays this out. There's five things in the Abrahamic promise that was given by God. Let's look at it. The first one is God says, I'll guide you. I'm going to give you divine action in your life, in your descendants' lives. God says, I'm going to be there. That there's going to be a blessing upon those who would, uh, would bless him and a curse that, against those who would curse him. And that all the other nations would receive a divine blessing through him. That was the promise that God gave Abraham. The law had nothing to do with it. It's only because Abraham had faith in God. So as believers, 
the Galatians and us should never look at doing anything else to earn salvation but have faith in Jesus Christ. You don't have to do rituals. You don't have to do ceremonies. I said it last week. We love communion. It's a very powerful, spiritual, biblical thing, but it has nothing to do with salvation. Neither does baptism. Nothing to do with salvation. It's faith and faith alone because if it required anything of me and you to do, then it's works driven. And that's contrary to God's word. So he goes on here and it says in verse 19, Where then serveth the law? In other words, well, what purpose did the law even have? Why was it even given? That's important, isn't it? If, they, if the Judaizers had come in and told the Galatians, you got to follow the law. you got to start doing Jewy things. <laughs> you got to start being like a Jew. So Paul's saying, no, 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 no. But what's the purpose of the law? He goes on to say it was added because of transgressions. It was added because of our inability to satisfy God. In other words, it's there to show you that you can't meet God's standard. It's there to show you that you can't reach it. Now, I don't know. Have y'all ever watched the Summer Olympics when those people do pole vaulting? That's amazing, isn't it? That they can take that little bitty skinny pole and run up there and shoot 17 feet up in the air and go over it. That's an amazing thing. I tried to do that when I was in middle school. I tried to, try, tried to do some pole vaulting. Uh, I found out if you don't hold real tight to the pole and, and bend your body back, all you'll do is slide down the pole straight down. Everybody laughs at you. I can tell you that's what happens. Uh, I couldn't do it. And I actually got to where I could kind of get over about three feet or <laughs> I don't know, just a little bit. I couldn't do it. I find it amazing, these people. But, you know, at some point that pole gets high enough that nobody else can reach it. Paul's saying the law is so high that man can't reach it, and it's set there for that purpose to show you you can't please God. You cannot please God unless you have faith in God. That's the only way, that's the only purpose it has. It says, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. Who's the seed? Well, the seed is Jesus Christ. And he fulfilled the law. He's the one that done it all. He's the one. He's the one. And then it goes on to say, um, and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. The law was handed down to Moses on the mountain with angels involved. Now, we know Moses was there with God, but angels were involved. According to right here, angels were involved in it. Do you all remember what Paul said last week in the first chapter? Paul said, if anybody, including me or angels from heaven, come down and preach a different gospel to you, let them be accursed. You, here, he's, try, he's drawing something in here. He's saying angels were involved in giving that law. But you remember I just told you earlier in the later, it, it, the same angels that were involved in that day, give, helping give that law, helping with their Moses, even if those same angels come down and say, you've got to follow this law, let them be accursed. Because they're lying to you. Right. So he's, he's making sure they understand this. But he says, now a mediator is not a mediator of one. In other words, it's not just one person. You can't mediate something by yourself. There has to be two parties involved, right? There has to be you, and then there's God. And in the middle is this mediator. This one that's the go-between, between the two parties. That's what a mediator does. And that mediator is the seed of promise, the one that God said would come. And Paul's saying that one is Christ Jesus. He's the one, the one and only that has authority to stand between you and God and make things right. And you can't leave and add any extra works to it or do anything on your part to it. You just got to have faith in him. So... He goes on to say in verse 21, he said, Is the law then against the promises of God? And he said, God forbid, for if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been given by the law. But the scripture hath concluded all are under sin, and that the promise of faith by Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. So Paul's laying this out. He's saying, If righteousness could have been attained by the law 
then Christ would have died in vain. He said that in chapter 2. If you could have worked your way in, if you could have done enough to be in right relationship with God, Christ's death would have been in vain. He's laying it out here again that Jesus Christ is the only way because we're all under sin. We're all unable to keep God's standard. It was there to make people aware of their sin problem and reflect that they have a need for a mediator. The very thing that people relied on for salvation, which was, was the works of the law, is the very thing that reveals how inadequate they were. Why did they have to continually offer sacrifices year after year after year, month after month? Because those sacrifices did not atone for a lasting relationship with God. Only, only the perfect Lamb of God could do that. A lot of people today think they can work their way into heaven. You see that all the time. I mean, people come out and they work tirelessly, constantly, trying to do things to earn favor with God. You see the same thing happen in a workplace, that people go in and they work, 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 trying to earn favor with the boss man. Right? And 99.99% of the time, the boss man says, well, you got that much in, in you, let's get a little more. Let's get, they don't work favor, they get abused. They get used. And that's just the way it works. You can't work your way into favor with God. You have to have faith in Him. The only way, the only way we can have right standing is to have absolute, total trust in Him. Now, I don't know about you. Some of you may be a lot further along spiritually than I am. But there's times when I have problems in trust. Not that I lack God having ability. I'm human. And there's times when I have to pray, God, I know that you can. I know that you can. You're all powerful. You're sovereign. You can do everything. But there's times I struggle. And I bet sometimes you do too. This is written for us today. There's nothing extra you can do. You just got to have faith. And that's what Paul's trying to get these people. That's why he's trying to get these foolish Galatians, these poor blessed Galatians, ignorant people as they were, to understand you have no control over anything. Paul's writing and saying, hey, Chuck, you poor old foolish fella. There's nothing you can do. It's all in God's hands. Trust Him. Will you trust Him? Will you trust Him today and quit worrying about everything? And quit stressing out about everything? God's got it. Believe in Him. Believe on Him. Living by faith is a difficult daily proposition. It really is. Why? Because we have the world constantly pulling at us, tugging at us, showing us we're just like Peter. We look at Jesus, we have faith, we get out of that boat, and then we look at the waves around us, and we sink. But just like him, a three-word prayer, Lord, save me, is all we got to do. Have trust and faith in him. Thank you all for being here this morning.